Good evening, listeners, and welcome to an episode of Red Moon Roleplaying. Today's episode is very special because we have a multitude of special guests. Now, some you'll be familiar with, but I can assure you one is its first appearance. And this is none other than Mr. Jason Carl. Good evening. Hello, good evening. I'm Jason Carl. I'm the brand marketing manager for the World of Darkness at Paradox Interactive. I'm the storyteller and host of Vampire the Masquerade Streaming Chronicles, LA by Night and Seattle by Night. But tonight, I'm a Hakata. Hmm, what could that mean? We'll find out shortly, listeners. But what's this? We have other guests as well. Clara, welcome back. How are you this evening? I'm excited to play instead of storytell for once. Indeed, indeed. And just in case, just in case people have missed it, who are you, Clara? Perhaps we have new listeners this evening. Well, um, yeah, my name is Clara, and I am a freelance writer, freelance RPG writer, and I've written for Onyx Path for some time now, and I've... Um, I am currently in mid-recording of, uh, well, not right now, but I am in mid-recording of The Sacrifice, um, which is also a Red Moon role-playing game, um, and it's in Chicago by Night for V5, so if you're interested in that, we are almost finishing the end, so tune in to, to listen to that. Sorry for selflessly promoting my own game in your game. I guess it's for, if it's for the same channel, I think it's okay, isn't it? It's totally fine. It's totally fine. Speaking of promoting games, Bianca from Mummy the Curse. Hello. How are you this evening? I am very well, actually. Just in case someone's missed you, who are you, Bianca Savazin? <laughs> so I work as a freelance writer mostly for Onyx Path, and in addition, I also do freelance game design for Paradox Interactive. Mm, exciting stuff. And finally, apparently you do need a storyteller to tell you these things, but wait, isn't Clara Herbal the storyteller? No, no, tonight it is the master of horror himself, Matthew Dawkins. That feels like a promotion. Uh, hello. Uh, good to be here, as ever, on Red Moon Roleplaying. And yes, once again, I've been roped into storytelling for you bums. Although this is the first time that I'm running a game for Jason. Uh, we've. It's interesting. I've worked with everyone here, uh, I guess, in sense with Craig, uh, with Red Moon Roleplaying. But I've worked with everyone here in various capacities. Everything seems linked to either Paradox Interactive, Onyx Path, or White Wolf, so it's it's a good thing we're running Vampire the Masquerade. I will be running V5 with a special focus on Cults of the Blood Gods, which, as of time of recording, will be on Kickstarter, or about to go on Kickstarter. And it's the big book of religion for Vampire, a book that hasn't ever really been made before for Vampire the Masquerade, that handles all manner of spirituality, faith, perverse belief, and the cults that are in, that are in the name. Uh, everything from the Church of Set to the Cult of Mithras, the Bahari, the Church of Cain, and of course the Hecata, as Jason mentioned. They are undoubtedly the core element of Cults of the Blood Gods, the Clan of Death, uh, at various points known as the Cappadocians, the Giovanni, Harbingers, Samedi, and they are all present in Cults of the Blood Gods. You will get to see a fraction of that in the course of this game, but hopefully it will motivate you to check the Kickstarter out if you haven't already, and otherwise be a very enjoyable listen. Indeed, I am looking forward to it greatly. I am very happy to have you all here. I think this is a great bunch of people, and I am very excited to delve into Cults of the Blood Gods. So with that, Matthew, I shall let you take us into what we're doing this evening. 
Our chronicle is set in the modern night's New York City, at least initially. Our characters are each members of Clan Hecata. Although the name Hecata is either a new or very old addition to the Clan of Death's retinue, it's a bloodline, a clan, a conglomeration of necromantic vampires. Bound by blood, by family, by a loyalty that few other kindred share among each other. But, like all families, the Hecata are prone to self-destruction, implosion, and fights across the dinner table, just as often as they are inclined to work together towards some great or terrible aim. In our story, we will see a disparate group of vampires coming together to serve a singular purpose, though whether they remain aligned and serving the clan by the end of it will be seen. The first thing we need to do is have introductions to our characters. Now, as mentioned, we have four players in this game. We're going to start with Craig. Craig, who are you playing in this chronicle? I shall be playing Joe, or Joey, Pudanesca. Although that's no longer the name I use for most people, I now go by the alias John Smith. There's a reason for that. Joey was a young boy growing up with a family in the rougher parts of New York. He had a hard life, got into some trouble every now and then, but his mother and his sister often kept him on the straight and narrow, even if his father was a little more encouraging of being a tough person in this world. His father had a strange family background. We didn't really hear much about the rest of his family. My mother didn't want anything to do with them. The father agreed, although he would still sometimes meet up with these individuals. One of them being my uncle, Uncle Moses. My mother said he was bad news, and I believed her for the most part. But it was strange how every now and again he'd come and visit my father. Now my father... As time went on and I grew into a man, got into gambling problems, and uh, fortunately, the uh, family got in debt. And I needed to help out. And I was willing to do anything, anything, especially for my sister and my mother. They meant the world to me. So I sought out Moses. I said I'd do whatever he wanted, as long as I got money. And Uncle Moses was very happy to bring me into the fold, ghouling me and using my services for petty crime, driver stuff, fixing things, little things. But he liked my style, and I got a reward one day in the form of an embrace into the Pudanesca line of the Giovanni family. Now, unfortunately, things with the Clan of Death haven't gone very well for the last five, six years that I've been a vampire. And it was decided early on that I would be better off no longer existing. As in, officially anyway. So, my uncle arranged for a nice car accident. And so, Joe Pudanesca died five years ago. Since then, I've been John Smith. And I do driving work and clean-up work for the clan. I don't really have a choice. But, as my sire told me often... This was to keep my family safe. And that's what I wanted. So I've gone along with it. And that's, I suppose, where we'll find out what happens next. I have a one question for you, Craig, regarding John Smith. Hmm. Was he born and raised in New York? Yes. How does he balance the knowledge of living in a city where he grew up as a mortal... And knowing that his mortal persona is, for all intents and purposes, dead. How does he act if and when people recognise him? I try and avoid that. 
I barely have a life anymore, really. I pretty much do what I'm supposed to do and spend the rest of the time out of sight. I've been trained and I've got to know people who are good at that sort of thing. Again, if I mess up, I've been told, it's my family who are going to pay. Luckily, my Uncle Moses managed to arrange a very good false identity and most government record of me has been zeroed out. Again, the Giovanni money there, although it's gone now, I feel, in my mind anyway. In short, people don't see me in my city anymore, and if they do, they just see a guy called John Smith, and I do my best to be quiet, not make a scene. I find that hard, because I enjoyed life. I really did. But I need to protect the family. And I need to honour my new family, because I was told by my mother to honour your vows. It's one of my convictions, and even if I don't like the work I do, I do it. Because I have vowed I would. For the clan. Perfect. What about you, Clara? Who are you playing? Well, I am also playing a character with an Italian name because I am of Italian heritage. I am playing Natalie D'Angelo, former Natalie Giovanni. And there's a reason for that. She grew up in the east end of Manhattan in a very, very fortunate and rich childhood. Um, her father especially was known for being um, very good at dealing drugs. He, he was the cocaine overlord for a very long time in New York and harvested all the money he could from from that and made his family live in complete richness. Um, so she never really had a very troubled childhood and she was also incredibly spoiled. When she was around 18 years old, she met a man. His name was Sammy, Sammy Giovanni. Now the family she was in, um, her mortal family, was affiliated with the Giovanni family. They were actually um, ghouls for the Giovanni family, so they knew Sammy. And Sammy was a man who was incredibly charming and very good at getting what he wanted. And he wanted Natalie. But Natalie wasn't necessarily very keen on him. So the only way he could get her addicted to him without embracing her was getting her addicted to drugs. He um, got her addicted to heroin very, very quickly. And Natalie slipped into a big black hole and couldn't get up for a year at least and she was at her wit's end when she met another gentleman that was much older than she was but he saw something in her that was too precious to let drugs consume and this is uh, Mr. Mowbray who is a Cappadocian and this Cappadocian more or less saved her from her existence in drugs. He struck a deal with her family and Natalie was more or less gifted to him. And now she lives a completely opposite life of what she did when she was mortal. She lives in catacombs with Mr. Mowbray where she studies the out of necromancy. She has completely had a mental break from what she once was. She's not really sure what empathy is anymore. She wants to be empathetic, but she doesn't really know what it is. So reacting to things, reacting to certain situations can be difficult for her and she can say some things that will seem vile and horrible to some people, but she has the best intentions. I have a question for you, Clara. Was your sire Sammy Giovanni or this Mr. Mowbray? Well, my sire, my blood sire, was Sammy Giovanni. But Mr. Mowbray had a um, distinctive way of making her think that 
he was his her new, new sire. He actually fed her some um, some Cappadocian blood, which doesn't make her s- s- well situation easier. Okay, so it's quite possible she is blood bound to her adoptive sire. It very much is, yes. Jason, who are you playing as? I'm playing as Raymond Milliner, but you can call me Ray if you really want to. I'm an investment banker, or I was before I died. In the 1980s, the wheels came off the financial controls of this country, and Ray was at the forefront of it. The asymmetry of information research, mergers and acquisitions, trading volumes and patterns, buy and sell, everything went crazy. And nobody could figure out exactly what was going on. And it's only gotten worse since that initial impetus of uh, criminality invaded the investment banking system. Raymond took full advantage of this. And um, although he was aware of his family's ties to less than savory Uh, individuals and organizations, including some very strange uncles and aunts that visited the family retreat in the Hamptons and Cape Cod during the uh, holidays. Only at night, strangely enough, but who cares? When you've got that much money and success, mm, these things are mere eccentricities. He was too smart for his own good, however. And in a ill-advised trifecta of insider trading, front-running trades, and accounting irregularities, he ended up opposed to members of his own family unknowingly. So when he was visited late one night in his investment bank offices by some of those self-same aunts and uncles he had dismissed as old-fashioned and eccentric, it was a big shock to him to find out what was really going on in the Milliner family. This was in the 1990s during the height of irrational exuberance in the stock market when everybody had more money than they knew what to do with, including Raymond. He was unceremoniously indoctrinated and inducted into the clan. And ever since then, he has been atoning for his affront to the family dignity by making sure that every morning when the sun comes up and he sleeps, the family has more money than when he started at sunset. Very nice. And so how do you think he makes money primarily in these nights? Does he still maintain the same mortal identity that he had as Raymond Milliner, or does he operate through proxies? So he certainly isn't in the public eye any longer, and he resents this. He had it all. He was famous or infamous in uh, banking and society because of his family connections and his money, and uh, he misses that life. Uh, He no longer is visible any longer. Uh, As far as anyone knows, he is on an extended uh, retreat somewhere in Europe, uh, perhaps drying out after uh, drug abuse or other scandals, uh, avoiding the public eye, and he operates completely through intermediaries now. Uh, As a milliner, he's based out of Boston, but he's been tasked with uh, cleaning up some recent messes in New York City, which is why he finds himself in that city. Excellent. And finally, Bianca, who are you playing? I'm playing Maria Vianello. She grew up in the Italian neighborhood in Boston. So she came from a rather mid-sized family where she was the oldest sister having that role she um, she was relegated to looking after all of her siblings as well as all the other children 
in the apartment complex where she was living. This in turn made her very motherly and caring, so she decided that afterwards she would pursue a career in nursing, perhaps within the maternity ward. She always liked helping other women in particular, because as the children she looked after grew up, the ones that stayed connected with her were the, um, the girls that now were teens, so they came to her for all kinds of advice, and to her it was a great joy to watch this sisterhood grow, both in size, but also grow in maturity as time passed. She is very much of a person that wants to put family first, so very ride and die with the sisterhood. And that's when she was noticed by a member of the Bihari cult. Was rather intrigued how uh, protective and willing Maria was to lay down her life for anyone that she had looked after, but in particular her sisters. She very slowly started to introduce the idea of uh, the Bahari cult in particular, just the, the occult rituals, but then also Lilith, first as a Christian concept, then trying out the waters a bit and talking about how Lilith really is the modern woman of today's society. She is rebellious. She forges her own path, just testing, planting some seeds that Lilith isn't this demon per se. She's actually quite a figure to look up to. And Maria, she takes this in and being very afraid of letting others down, she essentially becomes a puppet to the Bihari, who then managed to convince her to first join as a servant, later on as a ghoul servant, until eventually they decide to invite her in as a kindred with the role of being a bodyguard to the family saying that she can continue her role as a guardian, but now much more powerful than what she could ever be as a mortal being. And I believe you said to me, Bianca, that you were thinking that she would, yes, be one of the Lamia. Mm-hmm. Uh, so that allows her to fit into the Hecata and the Bahari. So that's two cults for the price of one. Mm. I would like, as much as Maria may not like it, for her to have been assigned to good old Ray Molina, as they're both heading over from Boston to New York. It seems prudent that the family may have pulled some strings and asked for this Lamier to act as chaperone and enforcer should Ray meet any strife in New York City. Very well. He, he is certainly not her typical ward, but that is what the family commands. Now, listeners familiar with the meta plot of Vampire the Masquerade may be wondering how is it that we are going to have a Melina, a Putanesca, an adoptive Cappadocian and a Lamier in the same coterie. 
Partly, I'm going to have to direct you to cults of the blood gods for that, because of course I am. But I will explain something. There has been an event in the meta plot of V5 known as the Family Reunion. Due to the various external pressures and internal, the pull of the blood, there are aspects of what was once Clan Giovanni, the remnants of Clan Cappadocia, and the various bloodlines of death that were forced to come together or face destruction. The world of darkness has become increasingly hostile to those who would stand alone, hence why the Banu Hakim have joined the Camarilla, why the Ministry have joined the Anarchs, and why, as of Chicago by night, members of Clan La Sombra are also flocking to the Camarilla. And so the Hecata, for reasons that we will get into, have never been permitted to join any sect. They have had to look to their own. It may not hold. As I mentioned earlier, families have a way of busting up, especially when pressure gets too great and no one truly forgets old enmities. But for now, the family is reunited. Not everyone likes it. In fact, very few people do. But when the question is one of survival, you do what you must. Natalie. I have a question for you. You've been my apprentice now for the best part of three years. I've shown you a great deal. I have allowed you to sample my vitae. We have reclaimed cadavers for experimentation. Yes, and you feel you have learned a lot? The great question that has always vexed our clan is to do with the moment of death. Do you remember your embrace? Some of it, I think. You were high, weren't you? I think so. I think you told me I was. I'm asking what you remember, not what I've told you. I... Natalie looks down. She... She's always timid when talking about her biological sire around her adoptive sire because she knows how much he loathes him. I am... Um, I just woke up and felt different. Mm. I, I think we had a party and... And it was one of those parties where we just... You know, if you saw a syringe on the table, you just used it. Disgusting. Yeah. Um. But I didn't take anything. Well, not physically. Um. Sammy gave it to me, or he injected it into me, and he said that. That it would make me feel better. And then I blacked out and I I thought I had withdrawal symptoms when I woke up and I was I was shaking and I was I had the taste of like iron. I thought I bit my tongue. Mm. Because you you have know, seen sometimes when people have withdrawal symptoms they shake. You know? And they they stiffen up. And they almost, I've seen one of my friends, he bought, he, his entire tongue, he just, he just bit off. He almost died. Well, thank goodness you didn't, otherwise you wouldn't have such fascinating conversations. And then, I woke up and I couldn't eat anything, and I couldn't sleep, and I couldn't exist almost but I don't remember why that happened I don't remember the embrace right that's a common phenomenon among our kind not to remember the exact moment of death it's something many of us wish we could it would teach us a great deal if we could just analyze those seconds between consciousness and undeath 
Well, I was merely wondering if any of that had come back to you. But I do have a question for you. I don't think death is scary anymore. Oh, really? I, I used to think, yeah. I used to think that death was scary, but I don't... I don't think so anymore. It's so peaceful down here. Well, he stands up at that, claps his hands on his thighs. Then I have some wonderful news for you, Natalie. You see, we've been experimenting with cadavers for, as I say, years now. Animals and humans, when we've been able to acquire a body, obviously, most of them have been vagrants. Never before have I expected you to experiment with someone still living. I don't really like the living anymore. Well, we still have to feed, don't we? They talk too much. Mm-hmm. Well, this one won't. Oh. She's doped up just like you used to be. He disappears into a side chamber and then helps a woman out his arm around her back, her arm limply over his shoulders. She is clearly disorientated. Interesting, you know, something I've not really told you over the years is how often your sire, Samuel, he desperately wants to get in contact with you. I don't know how much of it is guilt, how much of it is obsession, interest, love... It doesn't really matter. At first he used to try and find this place down here. He would get lost, hopeless. He's a high society type. Then he would start sending emissaries on his behalf, and they had the same problem. When we last attended a family dinner, that's where he first passed a letter on to me to reach to you. He wanted you to see his words in writing, and I didn't pass that message on. I do not feel it would have been good for your development. Uh, since that time, he has found ways to get more messages to me that I have not passed on. I imagine it is torturing him inside to know that he has no contact with you. But such is life. Why am I telling you this? Well, this young woman is the last or latest in the series of gifts from your sire. Oh. Hello. She, she's not nearly conscious enough to know that she's here. Uh, the drugs in her system are his. Uh, the party she was attending was one of his. And by gift, I mean she was procured and brought down here because I feel that for you to truly understand death, you need to be able to look it in the face, Natalie. And you have a lot of bravado. You say that death means nothing to you and you dislike the living. Well, he pretty much shoulders the woman towards you. Do you catch her? I, I try to. You do, then. You catch her in your arms. Here is someone living on the brink of death. If you place her on the table over there, we can start with the study of when life leaves the body. A light just appears in Natalie's eyes. It's almost like she is intrigued by the situation more than she's appalled or scared. She is studying the woman up and down and up and down and looking at it's like she's looking at her every vein that is every artery that's pulsating just ever so slowly she's eating her up with her eyes not in a seductive or attraction way but more in a she just finds her incredibly interesting maybe it's because she hasn't really interacted with any Models in a very long time like this um, Actually living models. Maybe it's just because It reminds her of all of the parties she used to go to back in her mortal days, although those memories are quite fussy Lift her onto the table. I'm not going to help you um, Okay, 
She struggles to get her up on the table. She's not a very big girl, but she 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 manages to get her onto her back on the table. Wonderful. Now, this is a simple experiment. You have dabbled in what some call the dark arts for quite some time and showed quite some um, prestige in doing so. But the one thing I have never seen you do is take a life. Do you want it to be slow or quick? <laughs> I would be interested to see what you would gravitate toward. You have your surgical tools. Well, my surgical tools. You are free to use whatever you see fit. When did she get here? How long has she been here? She's uh, She arrived early evening. Okay. Um, Natalie gets up on the table with her. She is sitting on top of this woman who is making almost like sleeping noises. She's put either of her hands on either side of her head and she's staring into her face. She doesn't really understand how close you are to people really anymore before it gets uncomfortable for them. And she's looking her up and down. She seems dehydrated, first of all. Wouldn't you agree? I think that's likely, given what she has in her system. Do you have any more drugs? No, this isn't a pharmacy. And did she have something on her? Mm, there she had a small bag of powder. And that won't be enough. Hmm. Why, what are you proposing? What is it that drives you? I just want to see her overdose. Why is that? Because I haven't seen it before. You wouldn't believe it, but I haven't. I told you about the guy that, that bit off his tongue, but he bled to death. He didn't overdose. So... This is very interesting. So I, w I would like to see that. He brings his mobile phone out and taps something in. You know there's no signal down here, but this is how he often makes notes. Well, he throws the small bag in your direction. That won't be enough. If you inject it into her heart, uh, I imagine that will be sufficient. Oh, that's a good idea. Okay, give me a second. She gets off the table and walks over to a little separate table where there are a couple of surgical tools. And she starts um, mixing. Almost like she's done it before, which her abductive sire knows she has. Um, almost like she's done it a thousand times before. She's quick, professional, um, and almost gets every single drop into the syringe, this brown liquid gives off this kind of almost herbal smell in the laboratory then. So I need... She picks up a syringe that's quite long. Um, at least six to seven centimeters long. Yeah, I think this will be enough. She walks over to the woman lying on the table and she measures the syringe um, from her side, almost like she's uh, measuring like how 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 tall she is on the table, if the syringe can really reach into her heart, and the heart is pretty close to she mumbles as she switches out the syringe with an even longer syringe. She looks very satisfied over at her adoptive sire. I think this will be fine, and you are prepared to inject her now, yeah. Now, now? Or should we wait a couple of days? I would prefer that you stop right now with what you're doing. Put the syringe on the table. But wasn't I supposed to kill her? You don't recognize the musician being played on the stereo right now. But the music is pumping, it's loud, it's throbbing, it's pulsating. There's a thrum to this apartment, this party in this apartment block. 
a real life to it, a real vivaciousness. Everyone here is here for a good time, no holds barred, the gloves are off. You know, Natalie, that this place is a place people come to, to, well, sample some of the illegal pleasures of the night. And you're very familiar with them. You have been for quite some time now hooked to all kinds of fun little chemicals that just make your mind go pop. Because after all, when you've got as much money as you have, you've got as many connections as you have, and you've got friends in so many high places, it really takes something to excite you. I wouldn't call you jaded, but certainly experienced would be a adequate way of describing your outlook. There's people you know, people you don't. As usual, the men and the women are dressed up, whilst also simultaneously looking somewhat dressed down or undone. You know people are going off into side rooms for a quick fuck, or for a quick hook-up. They are very brazen. They're silver trays with lines of cocaine... There's very well-rolled spliffs being handed around. And you know... That in some of those bedrooms... There's some grade A heroin. Just ready in a clean needle for the right recipient. Again, this isn't the first party of this kind you've been to. But you were invited to this one specifically... Because apparently there's a new drug on the street. And when there's something new... You like to feel it in your veins. Who am I there with? Am I alone? Natalie, you've come here with a couple of girlfriends. But you know who's going to be here. The guy who hooks you up more often than not. Sammy. Sammy G, he's often called. You know his surname's Giovanni. But Sammy G is how he's known on most street corners. He rubs shoulders with the high and mighty. But he's, he's trash. You know he's trash. But he has access to good quality chemicals. That's what matters. Main issue is he just won't leave you alone. He's taken a fondness to you. He calls it love. You think it might be obsession. You can see him on the other side of the apartment. He hasn't seen you yet. Sarah, one of your friends, leans in. Hey, do you think they got uh, any of that Grey Goose here? That's my favourite brand of vodka. Um... Yeah, sure. I mean, it looks like they have everything here. Well, you know, this is my first time coming to one of these places. Yeah, just don't look like it's your first time. Just try to, you know, look a little more, um, in. (laughs) You look like a deer in headlights. I'm I'm sorry. (laughs) Okay, I'll I'll find a corner. I'll look confident. I'm not going to cramp your style or anything. Uh, You know what? If you could try and find some of that, you know, new stuff, you know, um, that would be great. So I think you should go and talk to that guy over there. I point at Sammy. I I think he knows where it is. She puts her fingers through her hair. Ah, yeah, yeah, sure, sure. I'll I'll go do that. Uh, you you wait right there. I'll be right back. You often push Sarah around. She is someone easily pushed around and frankly the number of times you sent her down to a corner to pick up some hash uh, you've lost count in fact she's even been pinched a few times by the cops but she's never turned you in she's never said who she's buying for and she's got just as wealthy a family as you have so she rarely stays in the impound for for long i'm not gonna wait around on the sofa or wherever I was. I'm gonna stay in the area, but I'm gonna go around and try to mingle a bit. I'm gonna see if I can find some alcohol. Preferably something free. As you uh, head over to the bar that's been set up, it's a pretty well appointed. uh, Could be uh, an officially legally licensed bar, but you know it isn't just from where it happens to be. The man behind, shaved head, stubble on his chin, What's your pleasure? Ah, oh, you look scary. <laughs> you look hot. You need something to cool you down? Yeah, actually I do. Something really expensive would be nice. Yeah, well, you know. Cash has no value here. 
What's your name? He pours you something tall and pushes it towards you. I'm Natalie. Natalie. Natalie Giovanni. Giovanni. Oh, I recognize that name. Well. Yeah. Who do you know here, Natalie Giovanni? <laughs> uh, I wish I didn't know them, but Sammy over there? Uh, yeah. Well, he likes to get to know me, that's for sure. Uh, he's like a leech. It's a schmuck on wheels, is what he is. You enjoy that drink, Natalie. It's one of my favorites. Thank you. Few people are dancing, but not many. The music here is all for background. It's to set a tone. It's to make people feel hot and uneasy and needing to move around. Some of them to chat, some of them just to sample new pleasures. You can actually hear moans, cries from one of the rooms just off to the side. There's a seedy element to this so-called high-class drug den that even you, with all of your experience, can't help but feel a little uncomfortable about. Still, people don't do things like inject or draw blood or spill bodily fluids in public, so at least there's that. I'm going to sit around. I'm going to see if I can see Sarah from where I'm sitting, see if she's successful. She's uh, talking to Sammy. She's doing a motion you recognize very well. It's her begging motion. Both her hands are at her sides. They're going up and down, you know, in a, oh, please, please. Such a little girl attitude. It's the kind of thing that really makes you resent being around her. The other friend you arrived with, Jennifer, who's been pretty quiet up until now, she's leaning back beside you. So, uh, this, this new drug, I hear they're calling it Nirvana or something. Like the band? That's so yeah. cliche. Well, you know, it's a street name, hon. I hear it's just some souped up MDMA or some shit. I mean, whatever it is, I just want to try it. Like, uh, there's not going to be a new drug out that I'm not going to try. Well, I know what you get like. You're like a kid in a candy store. Just, you know, I got your back, Natalie, but you've been burning it at both ends recently. Yeah, whatever. I have my dad. He'll make sure I'm fine. As long as you have the money, you can basically do anything, right? Daddy's little girl, right? Oh, yeah. Absolutely. You know, sometimes I'm jealous. Sometimes I'm jealous of your, you having your dad still around. But then I think with mine dead and gone trust fund paying out I don't know sometimes I'm jealous sometimes I'm not why does she always do that Sarah Natalie looks over at Sarah why does she always do that that fucking begging thing like grow up she thinks people like that innocent little girl look yeah it's not working with Sammy he likes to chase people who doesn't like a victim that just throws themselves into him, his arms. He's like a... I don't know. He's not even a predator, he's just like a leech, you know? As if to accentuate your point, you can see him laughing in Sarah's face. He taps her on the ass and pushes her away. She comes back over with a sad face and a shrug. I'm sorry, I really tried. Just... Sit there and be near Jennifer, and I'm gonna go and do this thing. <sighs> um, Natalie's gonna get up and walk over to Sammy, looking displeased about the upcoming meeting. <laughs> if it ain't my favorite girl. Wait, who is she behind me? Don't be silly now. Don't play games. Come in, come in for a kiss. No, no. Ah, I gotta keep trying though, don't I? Yeah, I'm sure you do. Hey, uh, that new drug, uh, you know, Nirvana. <laughs> yeah, it's a dumb name, isn't it? It really is. It's fucking stupid. Anyway, do you have it, or...? Yeah, you know, I got what you need. I got everything you need. Yeah? Why? Are you looking for some alone time with, uh, Sammy G? No, I'm looking for the drug. Yeah, well, you know what you gotta do to get the drug. What is that, Sammy? Do I have to fuck you? What, again? <laughs> <laughs> the other guys around him give him the elbows, the acknowledgements, the usual dickish behavior. Yeah, just so you guys know, 
You never fuck me, okay? So you can just drop that attitude right there. He flashes his teeth at you. You're not sure whether it's a smile or whether it's a warning. Let's go find a bedroom. I'll hook you up. You and me alone? Yeah, me and you alone. What, do you want to bring one of your girlfriends for protection? Natalie looks back at her two girlfriends, at Jennifer, who looks like she's zoned out, and at Sarah, who looks more scared than before. No, I'll handle this myself. You know you're safe with me. He puts his arm around you. Sure, Sammy. No, I know. He whispers to you as you're walking across the apartment, his voice just loud enough over the music. I know you've been taking some heavy shit recently, I know, because I'm the one giving it to you. But this... This is, uh, heavier than most. You know, this is like a black hole. This is, uh... A mass you wouldn't be able to comprehend. The people on the street, they're calling it Nirvana. People on my end, they're calling it Entropy. I don't know what that word means. (laughs) End of things is what it means. Oh. Okay. I'm not scared, Sammy. You said said the same thing about the last drug I tried. I don't even remember the name. It barely affected me. Well, kid, I know you like... uh, (laughs) I know you like what I got, so... He pushes you into a room, closes the door behind the both of you. Ah, Natalie, it's... I've been wanting to get alone with you for so long. It's been a while since you've just let me uh, stick you with a needle. Huh. Yeah. Natalie starts to feel a little uncomfortable. She's starting to maybe regret that she went into a room with him alone. Um, But she tries to shrug it off. She tries to pretend that she isn't. Yeah, whatever. It's like, it's fine. As long as you don't get too near. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I gotta get a bit close, you know, gotta make the vein pop. You know, I look at you, Natalie. He edges quite close to you. And then turns abruptly, goes to a bedside table. There's a rolled up fabric in there that he unfurls as like a little doctor's kit. I see you walking around all confident, happy to speak to any guy, chat him up. Suck his cock. Get whatever you need. To get whatever you need. Mm Mm-hmm. Well, that makes me sound like a slut, but okay. I just want to know, why why don't you ever do that kind of thing for me? I don't mean that. I mean, you're always so hostile. I've been good to you. Because, Sammy, you're just too... You, you're just too... You're too much. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I get that a lot. Too much. Why don't you lay down on the bed? Don't worry. I'm not going to do anything inappropriate. The only thing I'm going to be uh, sliding inside you is... And he pulls a needle out. And don't worry, they're clean. Of course. I, I know your utilities are always clean. clean. So... She, um, she lies down on the bed. And... Lays her arm flat on it. You sure we should be going for this arm again, Natalie? It's starting to show the signs of these, uh... Frequent trips to the doctor. Oh, ew, yeah, I didn't even notice. That's disgusting. Okay, um... Where, then? He looks you up and down. There's a certain... Lasciviousness to the way that he's eyeing you up. But you're not sure it's sexual. He spends a long time staring at your neck. Then he goes to your thighs. Hmm. You never let me kiss you, Natalie. Uh, um, no, I, I guess not. Don't worry, I wouldn't do anything like that without your permission. But you can't blame a guy for dreaming. We're gonna go... Have you ever seen that movie, Pulp Fiction? Uh, my dad watches this all the time. It's super old. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I saw it when I was in the theater, but... Uh... I've seen it. Lady, uh... 
Uma something. Takes a shot to the heart. You ever taken a shot to the heart, Natalie? The heart? Uh, no. Do you even know where the heart is? <laughs> I, I know where a heart is, Natalie. Now, I want to open your mind like I've never done before. He looks over his shoulder as if there might be someone in the room. There isn't. And then he mutters. Yeah, I know what I'm doing. Yeah, I know. Who are you talking to? <laughs> Imaginary friend. Oh, great. <laughs> Don't worry, I'm just fooling with you. I can give you a speck of this Nirvana, what they're calling it, right into your heart. You'll feel it immediately. I got a needle, it's the right length, it'll go right in. And it'll spread through your body like a warmth you've never felt before. Have you tried it? Oh yeah. I wanna try it. Now, it's just gonna be a speck, a tiny one. This drug is so potent. It's a bit of a mix. I'm no chemist, but I'm told it's got a dab of heroin, dab of cocaine, you know, like a speedball. And something a little extra. We'll just do a little dot in your heart. See how it takes. Okay. You're a big girl, aren't you? You can take this. Yeah, I, I can take it. Yeah. Undo your top a little. Don't want to have to damage the fabric. She does that. Fiddling a little bit with her buttons because her hands are shaking so much. She's trying not to show how nervous she is, but she is frightened. Natalie, I've never seen you shake before. How what now? This just <laughs> it's nothing. It's an honor. Maybe you're just excited. Yeah, that's what it is. I'm so excited, like I'm just He sits on the edge of the bed. He's heavy enough to make the bed tilt a little. You don't go rolling off. You're just a little closer to him than you'd usually like. I have been following you for so long. He puts his left hand on your clavicle. Just gently. With his right, he has the hypodermic needle. It's long, like the kind of thing you might have seen in a show used to inject an animal. Yeah. I've been chasing you for so long. I really love you, Natalie. I wouldn't ever let anything bad happen to you. You're gonna love this. You are going to love it. He pushes the needle down, and he isn't fast. The immediate physical response of something slowly penetrating your chest is to buck, to writhe, to almost contort in reaction. But he holds you firm with his left hand almost pushing the air from your lungs. Ah, 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 he says. And then there's a sharp push. The plunger goes down. What happens next is stars. Stars and space. Void. And nothing. Just nothing. There's no sudden burst of warmth through your body. There's no rush of satisfaction that spreads from your chest through to your arms, your head, your legs. It's a cold grip that arrests your heart and then the rest of your organs. You don't know whether Sammy delivered you a hot dose. You don't know whether... Sammy underestimated the potency of this stuff. You don't know what he had planned. But your body goes into immediate shock and shutdown. Whatever he had in that needle should not have been injected into your heart. 
There's no strength to gasp out, to plead, to express your horror. You are trapped. You're locked in. And for a moment, you're on the ceiling. You're looking down at your body on the bed. It's like one of those awful stories you've heard or read before where you can suddenly see what's on top of the wardrobe. That's where that person put their wallet. Huh. But no, your eyes are looking at you and Sammy. And Sammy's reaction as your limbs spasm and your eyes flutter isn't to run for help isn't to perform CPR. At first he stands, his hand goes to his forehead, then you hear a laugh from him, and he leans down. He kisses you on the lips, and even from your disembodied state, that revolts you. He kisses you down your chest, he settles down towards your thigh. And you see him bite you. You see his teeth extend and sharpen. Somehow you can take it all in that he is biting into you. And your limbs spasming go rigid. Absolutely. Like a statue as he bites down and blood trickles out from around the corners of his mouth. Now you tell me, I gave you every choice, Natalie, and there is a fascination that I have in the way that you seem inclined to replicate your own death that you seem at the same time oblivious or at least delusional toward that you were overdosing when Sammy Giovanni embraced you. Oh, it may well have been the dose he gave you, but you still overdosed. And now you want to replicate it for this girl? Without a second thought? You have had it very easy, my girl for the last few years. Being a bagger, my ability to procure cold blood for you and you just drinking it from the bag, you have not had to exist as many of your family members have with the painful bite that they inflict on others. You have not had to hunt. You have just been able to drink and experiment, drink and experiment, and I have spoiled you. And now, without a second thought, you're prepared to take a life. Because I have been sequestering you for far too long. You sound angry. Why? I am disappointed. Why? I am not raising you to be some sociopath prepared to take a life at a moment's notice. You told me to. No. I asked you if you wanted to. I gave you the tools. You had every chance to have a conscience spike. But instead, you enthusiastically satisfied picked the right syringe to execute this young woman who you do not know. You do not know her background, who she leaves behind. When you are studying death, and when you want to have any kind of contact with the spirits the ghosts, the wraiths. You need to be aware of what they cling on to in life. You need to understand the importance of life. To be a truly adept necromancer, you can't just murder people. I just did what I was told to. And this is the problem. You are not taking responsibility no, you need to spend some more time among the living, and as much as I know you hate it, you need to actually ground yourself again in the life that you left behind. I have kept you down here for far too long. I am going to 
make reintroductions. I feel. Not your sire. Hmm. I'm going to have a word with uh, Donatello. The... The head of the family in New York. We need, a, need something for you to do that is out of this dark chamber. But I like it down here. It doesn't matter what you like. I don't know how to communicate with people. Well, you will have to learn. You have managed it with me, falteringly. Here's the first rule, Natalie. When someone becomes inconvenient or poses a fun experiment, you don't just end their life. You study it. I, I asked if I could leave her for a couple of days. We could study her. You know. No, I'm, I'm done with your excuses now. You're going to get properly dressed, and I think we are going to go up to the surface. You can be so much better. There's a new blackness, a new void. Natalie, the Wraith, how are you feeling right now? In complete, fascinated horror and shock. This is something Natalie has never, ever tried before, even with all of her other drugs. This experience is unearthly. It is beyond her wildest imaginations and she can't help but feel that with Sammy's reaction this is something he's planned all along but she doesn't get it why is he biting her why why isn't he taking advantage of her if he wanted to rape her well then that would be now but he isn't he's just biting her what's going on your eyes spring open. You're back in your body. You're still paralyzed, at least for the moment. And the scene around you has changed. You can see Sarah slumped in the corner. She has blood running down her neck. Her eyes are clouded over. Sammy has stood over you. He has some dried blood caked around his lips. And he's wiping it away with the back of his cuff. There's another man in there with him. You are a stupid, stupid boy, Samuel. You know you didn't seek permission for this. You should have called in advance at least. You are lucky I am here. This broad-shouldered man, thick glasses, balding on top. You don't recognize him. Ah, she's awake. What? what? Sammy? Sarah? You will not speak to him now. What? He made you. I will take you. No, what? Who are you? You're probably feeling very hungry right now. What happened to me? Where am I? Samuel, leave. You will not. Ever interfere with her again. Sam? He shrugs like a cheeky boy who's just been caught with his hand in the cookie jar. I'm sorry. Uh, guess I fucked up. <laughs> no. Sorry. Uh, uh, we, we'll, we'll catch up. No, you won't. Go. What's happening? I prepared the girl down there for you. She was very worried, but she wouldn't leave. What do you mean? Prepare. I don't think you're going to quite be able to cope with drinking from her, though, so I brought her back up. Drinking from her? He puts a clear bag on your chest, just between your hands that are going up towards where your heart was once beating. Am I dreaming? There's a nozzle on it. Put it in your mouth. It's like electrolytes. I'm sure, being a junkie, you have taken something like this before. I'm not a junkie. Drink it. 
Natalie puts her lips around the nozzle and starts drinking the liquid. It tastes vile, uh, but it's better than nothing right now because she is hungry in a way that she's never felt hunger before. She almost devours the entire bag in a matter of seconds. She is starving. <sighs> What's going on? What the fuck is going on? Who are you? That is the last time you will raise your voice with me. You will be coming with me. I will be keeping you safe. I will be teaching you because that is the measure of the deal. Get yourself dressed. Meet me outside. We have a little walk to get to the subway. What about Sarah? He looks at you very coldly, his head cocked to the one side. What about Sarah? You have listened to an episode of Red Moon Roleplaying, where we played The Family, a Cults of the Blood Gods Chronicle for Vampire the Masquerade 5th Edition. Cults of the Blood Gods is published by our friends at Onyx Path Publishing and is on Kickstarter right now. Our storyteller was the gentleman gamer Matthew Dawkins, and we were also joined by Jason Carl, Clara Herbel, and Bianca Savazzi. The music was created by Atrium Carceri, featuring many collaborations with other artists from their label, Cryo Chamber. Check them out at cryochamber.bandcamp.com and their YouTube channel for more amazing dark ambient. If you want more Vampire the Masquerade content, don't miss out on our chronicles No Man is an Island, as well as The Sacrifice for Chicago by Night. We would like to give massive thanks to our champions of the Red Moon, Martin Hoyshobear, Nastasha Rollerson, and David for their generous support. And we would of course also like to thank all of our other patrons. Without your support, the show would not be possible. If you want to support our work, please check us out on Patreon. You can get access to bonus campaigns for Cult Divinity Lost and Coriolis there, as well as get early and raw access to all of our recordings. You can also hear your name read on the show as a champion of the Red Moon, as well as play cult with us. Most importantly, that support is what keeps the show going, so do check us out there. Thank you again for listening, and see you soon again.